Lord Dies by Agatha Christie Audiobook 7x13 Who Killed Lord Edgeware? Poirot immediately sat up and shook his head vigorously. No, no. Not at all. Is it a question, that? You are like someone who reads the detective story and who starts guessing each of the characters in turn without rhyme or reason. Once, I agree, I had to do that myself. It was a very exceptional case. I will tell you about it one of these days. It was a feather in my cap. But of what were we speaking? Of the questions you were posing to yourself, I replied dryly. It was on the tip of my tongue to suggest that my real use to Poirot was to provide him with a companion to whom he could boast, but I controlled myself. If he wished to instruct then let him. Come on, I said. Let's hear them. That was all that the vanity of the man wanted. He leaned back again and resumed his former attitude. The first question we have already discussed. Why did Lord Edgeware change his mind on the subject of divorce? One or two ideas suggest themselves to me on that subject. One of them you know. The second question I ask myself is what happened to that letter? To whose interest was it that Lord Edgeware and his wife should continue to be tied together? Three. What was the meaning of the expression on his face that you saw when you looked back yesterday morning on leaving the library? Have you any answer to that, Hastings? I shook my head. I can't understand it. You are sure that you didn't imagine it? Sometimes, Hastings, you have the imagination on Puviv. No, no. I shook my head vigorously. I'm quite sure I wasn't mistaken. Yet. Then it is a fact to be explained. My fourth question concerns those pants Ness. Neither Jane Wilkinson nor Carlotta Adams wore glasses. What, then, are the glasses doing in Carlotta Adams' bag? And for my fifth question. Why did someone telephone to find out if Jane Wilkinson were at Chiswick and who was it? Those my friend, are the questions with which I am tormenting myself. If I could answer those, I should feel happier in my mind. If I could even evolve a theory that explained them satisfactorily, my amour proper would not suffer so much. There are several other questions, I said. Such as, who incited Carlotta Adams to this hoax? Where was she that evening before and after ten o'clock? Who is D who gave her the golden box? Those questions are self-evident, said Poirot. There is no subtlety about them. They are simply things we do not know. They are questions of fact. We may get to know them any minute. My questions, Monday Ami, are psychological. The little grey cells of the brain Poirot, I said desperately. I felt that I must stop him at all costs. I could not bear to hear it all over again. You spoke of making a visit tonight. Poirot looked at his watch. True, he said. I will telephone and find out if it is convenient. He went away and returned a few minutes later. Come, he said. All is well. Where are we going? I asked to the house of Sir Montague Corner at Chiswick. I would like to know a little more about that telephone call. Chapter 15, Sir Montague Corner It was about ten o'clock when we reached Sir Montague Corner's house on the river at Chiswick. It was a big house standing back in its own grounds. We were admitted into a beautifully panelled hall. On our right, through an open door, we saw the dining room with its long polished table lit with candles. Will you come this way, please? The butler led the way up a broad staircase and into a long room on the first floor overlooking the river. M. Hercule Poirot, announced the butler. It was a beautifully proportioned room, and had an old world air with its carefully shaded dim lamps. In one corner of the room was a bridge table, set near the open window, 
and round it sat four people. As we entered the room one of the four rose and came towards us. It is a great pleasure to make your acquaintance, M. Poirot. I looked with some interest at Sir Montague Corner. He had a distinctly Jewish cast of countenance, very small intelligent black eyes and a carefully arranged toupee. He was a short man five foot eight at most, I should say. His manner was affected to the last degree. Let me introduce you. Mr. and Mrs. Widburn. We've met before, said Mrs. Widburn brightly. And Mr. Ross. Ross was a young fellow of about twenty-two with a pleasant face and fair hair. I disturb your game. A million apologies, said Poirot. Not at all. We have not started. We were commencing to deal the cards only. Some coffee, M. Poirot. Poirot declined but accepted an offer of old brandy. It was brought us in immense goblets. As we sipped it, Sir Montague discoursed. He spoke of Japanese prints, of Chinese lacquer, of Persian carpets, of the French Impressionists, of modern music and of the theories of Einstein. Then he sat back and smiled at us beneficently. He had evidently thoroughly enjoyed his performance. In the dim light he looked like some genie of the medieval age. All around the room were exquisite examples of art and culture. And now, Sir Montague, said Poirot, I will trespass on your kindness no longer but will come to the object of my visit. Sir Montague waved a curious claw-like hand. There is no hurry. Time is infinite. One always feels that in this house, sighed Mrs. Widburn. So wonderful. I would not live in London for a million pounds, said Sir Montague. Here one is in the old world atmosphere of peace that alas, we have put behind us in these jarring days. A sudden impish fancy flashed over me that if someone were really to offer Sir Montague a million pounds, old world peace might go to the wall, but I trod down such heretical sentiments. What is money, after all? murmured Mrs. Widburn. Ah, said Mr. Widburn thoughtfully, and rattled some coins absent-mindedly in his trouser pocket. Charles, said Mrs. Widburn reproachfully. Sorry, said Mr. Widburn and stopped. To speak of crime in such an atmosphere, is, I feel, unpardonable, began Poirot apologetically. Not at all. Sir Montague waved a gracious hand. A crime can be a work of art. A detective can be an artist. I do not refer, of course, to the police. An inspector has been here today. A curious person. He had never heard of Benvenuto Cellini, for instance. He came about Jane Wilkinson, I suppose, said Mrs. Widburn with instant curiosity. It was fortunate for the lady that she was at your house last night, said Poirot. So it seems, said Sir Montague. I asked her here knowing that she was beautiful and talented and hoping that I might be able to be of use to her. She was thinking of going into management. But it seems that I was fated to be of use to her in a very different way. Jane's got luck, said Mrs. Widburn. She's been dying to get rid of Edgware and here's somebody gone and saved her the trouble. She'll marry the young Duke of Merton now. Everyone says so. His mother's wild about it. I was favorably impressed by her, said Sir Montague graciously. She made several most intelligent remarks about Greek art. I smiled to myself picturing Jane saying yes and no, really, how wonderful in her magical husky voice. Sir Montague was the type of man to whom intelligence consisted of the faculty of listening to his own remarks with suitable attention. Edgware was a queer fish, by all accounts, said Widburn. I dare say he's got a good few enemies. Is it true, M. Poirot, asked Mrs. Widburn, that somebody ran a penknife into the back of his brain. Perfectly true, 
Madam. It was very neatly and efficiently done scientific, in fact. I note your artistic pleasure, M. Poirot, said Sir Montague. And now, said Poirot, let me come to the object of my visit. Lady Edgeware was called to the telephone when she was here at dinner. It is about that telephone call that I seek information. Perhaps you will allow me to question your domestics on the subject. Certainly. Certainly. Just press that bell, will you, Ross? The butler answered the bell. He was a tall middle-aged man of ecclesiastical appearance. Sir Montague explained what was wanted. The butler turned to Poirot with polite attention. Who answered the telephone when it rang, began Poirot. I answered it myself, sir. The telephone is in a recess leading out of the hall. Did the person calling ask to speak to Lady Edgeware or to Miss Jane Wilkinson? To Lady Edgeware, sir. What did they say exactly? The butler reflected for a moment. As far as I remember, sir, I said hello. A voice then asked if I was Chiswick 43434. I replied that that was so. It then asked me to hold the line. Another voice then asked if that was Chiswick 43434 and on my replying yes it said, is Lady Edgeware dining there? I said her ladyship was dining here. The voice said, I would like to speak to her, please. I went and informed her ladyship who was at the dinner table. Her ladyship rose, and I showed her where the phone was. And then. Her ladyship picked up the receiver and said. Hello who's speaking? Then she said. Yes that's all right. Lady Edgeware speaking. I was just about to leave her ladyship when she called to me and said they had been cut off. She said someone had laughed and evidently hung up the receiver. She asked me if the person ringing up had given any name. They had not done so. That was all that occurred, sir. Poirot frowned to himself. Do you really think the telephone call has something to do with the murder, M? Poirot, asked M.R.S. Whitburn. Impossible to say, madam. It is just a curious circumstance. People do ring up for a joke sometimes. It's been done to me. Say to jurors possible, madam. He spoke to the butler again. Was it a man's voice or a woman's who rang up? A lady's, I think, sir. What kind of a voice, high or low? Low, sir. Careful and rather distinct. He paused. It may be my fancy, sir, but it sounded like a foreign voice. The R.S. were very noticeable. As far as that goes it might have been a Scotch voice, Donald, said M.R.S. Whitburn, smiling at Ross. Ross laughed. Not guilty, he said. I was at the dinner table. Poirot spoke once again to the butler. Do you think? he asked, that you could recognize that voice if you were to hear it any time. The butler hesitated. I couldn't quite say, sir. I might do so. I think it is possible that I should do so. I thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. The butler inclined his head and withdrew, pontifical to the last. Sir Montague Corner continued to be very friendly and to play his role of old world charm. He persuaded us to remain and lay bridge. I excused myself the stakes were bigger than I cared about. Young Ross seemed relieved also at the prospect of someone taking his hand. He and I sat looking on while the other four played. The evening ended in a heavy financial gain to Poirot and Sir Montague. Then we thanked our host and took our departure. Ross came with us. A strange little man, said Poirot as we stepped out into the night. The night was fine and we had decided to walk until we picked up a taxi instead of having one telephoned for. Yes, 
a strange little man, said Poirot again. A very rich little man, said Ross with feeling. I suppose so. He seems to have taken a fancy to me, said Ross. Hope it will last. A man like that behind you means a lot. You are an actor, Mr. Ross. Ross said that he was. He seemed sad that his name had not brought instant recognition. Apparently he had recently won marvelous notices in some gloomy play translated from the Russian. When Poirot and I between us had soothed him down again, Poirot asked casually. You knew Carlotta Adams, did you not? No. I saw her death announced in the paper tonight. Overdose of some drug or other. Idiotic the way all these girls dope. It is sad, yes. She was clever, too. I suppose so. He displayed a characteristic lack of interest in anyone else's performance but his own. Did you see her show at all? I asked. No. That sort of thing's not much in my line. Kind of craze for it at present, but I don't think it will last. Ah, said Poirot. Here is a taxi. He waved a stick. Think I'll walk, said Ross. I get a tube straight home from Hammersmith. Suddenly he gave a nervous laugh. Odd thing, he said. That dinner last night? Yes. We were thirteen. Some fellow failed at the last minute. We never noticed till just the end of dinner. And who got up first? I asked. He gave a queer little nervous cackle of laughter. I did, he said. Chapter 16 Mainly discussion When we got home we found Jap waiting for us. Thought I'd just call round and have a chat with you before turning in, M. Poirot, he said cheerfully. Eb yet, my good friend, how goes it? Well, it doesn't go any too well. And that's a fact. He looked distressed. Got any help for me, M. Poirot? I have one or two little ideas that I should like to present to you, said Poirot. You and your ideas. In some ways, you know, you're a caution. Not that I don't want to hear them. I do. There's some good stuff in that funny-shaped head of yours. Poirot acknowledged the compliment somewhat coldly. Have you any ideas about the double lady problem that's what I want to know? Eh, M. Poirot? What about it? Who was she? That is exactly what I wish to talk to you about. He asked Jap if he had ever heard of Carlotta Adams. I've heard the name. For the moment I can't just place it. Poirot explained. Her. Does imitations does she? Now what made you fix on her? What have you got to go on? Poirot related the steps we had taken and the conclusion we had drawn. By the Lord, it looks as though you were right. Clothes, hat, gloves, etc., and the fair wig. Yes, it must be. I will say you re the goods, M. Poirot. Smart work, that. Not that I think there's anything to show she was put out of the way. That seems a bit far-fetched. I don't quite see eye to eye with you there. Your theory is a bit fantastical for me. I've more experience than you have. I don't believe in this villain behind the scenes motif. Carlotta Adams was the woman all right, but I should put it one of two ways. She went there for purposes of her own blackmail, maybe, since she hinted she was going to get money. They had a bit of a dispute. He turned nasty, she turned nasty, and she finished him off. And I should say that when she got home she went all to pieces. She hadn't meant murder. It's my belief she took an overdose on purpose as the easiest way out. You think that covers all the facts? Well, naturally there are a lot of things we don't know yet. It's a good working hypothesis to go on with. 
The other explanation is that the hoax and the murder had nothing to do with each other. It's just a damned queer coincidence. Poirot did not agree, I knew. But he merely said noncommittally. Mays we, say possible. Or, look here, how's this? The hoax is innocent enough. Someone gets to hear of it and thinks it will suit their purpose jolly well. That's not a bad idea. He paused and went on. But personally I prefer idea no. 1. What the link was between his lordship and the girl will find out somehow or other. Poirot told him of the letter to America posted by the maid, and Jap agreed that that might possibly be of great assistance. I'll get on to that at once, he said, making a note of it in his little book. I'm the more in favor of the lady being the killer because I can't find anyone else, he said, as he put the book away. Captain Marsh, now, his lordship as now is. He's got a motive sticking out a yard. A bad record too. Hard up and none too scrupulous over money. What's more he had a row with his uncle yesterday morning. He told me that himself as a matter of fact which rather takes the taste out of it. Yes, he'd be a likely customer. But he's got an alibi for yesterday evening. He was at the opera with the Dortheimers. Rich Jews. Grosvenor Square. I've looked into that and it's all right. He dined with them, went to the opera and they went on to supper at Sobrani's. So that's that. And Mademoiselle. The daughter, you mean? She was out of the house too. Dined with some people called Carthew West. They took her to the opera and saw her home afterwards. Quarter to twelve she got in. That disposes of her. The secretary woman seems all right very efficient decent woman. Then there's the butler. I can't say I take to him much. It isn't natural for a man to have good looks like that. There's something fishy about him and something odd about the way he came to enter Lord Edgeware's service. Yes. I'm checking up on him all right. I can't see any motive for murder, though. No fresh facts have come to light. Yes, one or two. It's hard to say whether they mean anything or not. For one thing, Lord Edgeware's key's missing. The key to the front door. Yes. That is interesting, certainly. As I say, it may mean a good deal or nothing at all. Depends. What is a bit more significant to my mind is this. Lord Edgeware cashed a check yesterday not a particularly large one a hundred pounds as a matter of fact. He took the money in French notes that's why he cashed the check, because of his journey to Paris today. Well, that money has disappeared. Who told you of this? Miss Carroll. She cashed the check and obtained the money. She mentioned it to me, and then I found that it had gone. Where was it yesterday evening? Miss Carroll doesn't know. She gave it to Lord Edgeware about half past three. It was in a bank envelope. He was in the library at the time. He took it and laid it down beside him on a table. That certainly gives one to think. It is a complication. Or a simplification. By the way the wound. Yes. The doctor says it wasn't made by an ordinary penknife. Something of that kind but a different shaped blade. And it was amazingly sharp. Not a razor. No, no. Much smaller. Poirot frowned thoughtfully. The new Lord Edgeware seems to be fond of his joke, remarked Jap. He seems to think it amusing to be suspected of murder. He made sure we did suspect him of murder, too. Looks a bit queer, that. It might be merely intelligence. More likely guilty conscience. His uncle's death came very pat for him. He's moved into the house, by the way. Where was he living before? Martin Street, St. George's Road. Not a very swell neighborhood. 
You might make a note of that, Hastings. I did so, though I wondered a little. If Ronald had moved to Regent Gate, his former address was hardly likely to be needed. I think the Adams girl did it, said Jap, rising. A fine bit of work on your part, M. Poirot, to tumble to that. But there, of course, you go about to theatres and amusing yourself. Things strike you that don't get the chance of striking me. Pity there's no apparent motive, but a little spade work will soon bring it to light, I expect. There is one person with a motive to whom you have given no attention, remarked Poirot. Who's that, sir? The gentleman who is reputed to have wanted to marry Lord Edgeware's wife. I mean the Duke of Merton. Yes. I suppose there is a motive. Jap laughed. But a gentleman in his position isn't likely to do murder. And anyway, he's over in Paris. You do not regard him as a serious suspect, then. Well, M. Poirot, do you? And laughing at the absurdity of the idea, Jap left us. Chapter 17 The butler the following day was one of inactivity for us, an activity for Jap. He came round to see us about tea time. He was red and wrathful. I've made a bloomer. Impossible, my friend, said Poirot soothingly. Yes, I have. I've let that, here he gave way to profanity, of a butler slip through my fingers. He has disappeared. Yes. Hooked it. What makes me kick myself for a double-dyed idiot is that I didn't particularly suspect him. Calm yourself but calm yourself then. All very well to talk. You wouldn't be calm if you'd been hauled over the coals at headquarters. Oh. He's a slippery customer. It isn't the first time he's given anyone the slip. He's an old hand. Jap wiped his forehead and looked the picture of misery. Poirot made sympathetic noises somewhat suggestive of a hen laying an egg. With more insight into the English character, I poured out a stiff whiskey and soda and placed it in front of the gloomy inspector. He brightened a little. Well, he said. I don't mind if I do. Presently he began to talk more cheerfully. I'm not so sure even now that he's the murderer. Of course it looks bad his bolting this way, but there might be other reasons for that. I'd begun to get on to him, you see. Seems he's mixed up with a couple of disreputable nightclubs. Not the usual thing. Something a great deal more recherche and nasty. In fact, he's a real bad hat. Tout de mim that does not necessarily mean that he is a murderer. Exactly. He may have been up to some funny business or other, but not necessarily murder. No, I'm more than ever convinced it was the Adams girl. I've got nothing to prove it as yet, though. I've had men going all through her flat today, but we've found nothing that's helpful. She was a canny one. Kept no letters except a few business ones about financial contracts. They're all neatly docketed and labeled. Couple of letters from her sister in Washington. Quite straight and above board. One or two pieces of good old-fashioned jewelry nothing new or expensive. She didn't keep a diary. Her passbook and checkbook don't show anything helpful. Dash it all. The girl doesn't seem to have had any private life at all. She was of a reserved character, said Poirot thoughtfully. From our point of view that is a pity. I've talked to the woman who did for her. Nothing there. I've been and seen that girl who keeps a hat shop and who, it seems, was a friend of hers. Ah. And what do you think of Miss Driver? She seemed a smart wide awake bit of goods. She couldn't help me, though. Not that that surprises me. The amount of missing girls I've had to trace and their family and their friends always say the same things. She was of a bright and affectionate disposition and had no men friends. 
That's never true. It's unnatural. Girls ought to have men friends. If not there's something wrong with them. It's the muddle-headed loyalty of friends and relations that makes a detective's life so difficult. He paused for want of breath, and I replenished his glass. Thank you, Captain Hastings, I don't mind if I do. Well, there you are. You've got to hunt and hunt about. There's about a dozen young men she went out to supper and danced with, but nothing to show that one of them meant more than another. There's the present Lord Edgewayer, there's Mr. Brian Martin, the film star, there's half a dozen others but nothing special and particular. Your man behind idea is all wrong. I think you'll find that she played a lone hand, M. Poirot. I'm looking now for the connection between her and the murdered man. That must exist. I think I'll have to go over to Paris. There was Paris written in that little gold box, and the late Lord Edgewayer ran over to Paris several times last autumn, so Miss Carroll tells me, attending sales and buying curios. Yes, I think I must go over to Paris. Inquests tomorrow. It'll be adjourned. Of course. After that I'll take the afternoon boat. You have a furious energy, Jap. It amazes me. Yes, you're getting lazy. You just sit here and think. What you call employing the little grey cells. No good, you've got to go out to things. They won't come to you. The little maidservant opened the door. Mr. Brian Martin, sir. Are you busy or will you see him? I'm off, M. Poirot. Jap hoisted himself up. All the stars of the theatrical world seem to consult you. Poirot shrugged a modest shoulder, and Jap laughed. You must be a millionaire by now, M. Poirot. What do you do with the money? Save it. Assuredly I practice the thrift. And talking of the disposal of money, how did Lord Edgewayer dispose of his? Such property as wasn't entailed he left to his daughter. Five hundred to Miss Carroll. No other bequests. Very simple will. And it was made when? After his wife left him just over two years ago. He expressly excludes her from participation, by the way. A vindictive man murmured Poirot to himself. With a cheerful so long, Jap departed. Brian Martin entered. He was faultlessly attired and looked extremely handsome. Yet I thought that he looked haggard and not too happy. I am afraid I have been a long time coming, M. Poirot, he said apologetically. And, after all, I have been guilty of taking up your time for nothing. And Verite. Yes. I have seen the lady in question. I've argued with her, pleaded with her, but all to no purpose. She won't hear of my interesting you in the matter. So I'm afraid we'll have to let the thing drop. I'm very sorry very sorry to have bothered you do tout do tout, said Poirot genially. I expected this. At. The young man seemed taken aback. You expected this, he asked in a puzzled way. Mays we. When you spoke of consulting your friend I could have predicted that all would have arrived as it has done. You have a theory, then. A detective, M. Martin, always has a theory. It is expected of him. I do not call it a theory myself. I say that I have a little idea. That is the first stage. And the second stage. If the little idea turns out to be right then I know. It is quite simple, you see. I wish you'd tell me what your theory or your little idea is. Poirot shook his head gently. That is another rule. The detective never tells. Can't you suggest it even? No. I will only say that I formed my theory as soon as you mentioned a gold tooth. Brian Martin stared at him. 
I'm absolutely bewildered, he declared. I can't make out what you are driving at. If you'd just give me a hint. Poirot smiled and shook his head. Let us change the subject. Yes, but first your fee you must let me. Poirot waved an imperious hand. Pa Unsu. I have done nothing to aid you. I took up your time when a case interests me, I do not touch money. Your case interested me very much. I'm glad, said the actor uneasily. He looked supremely unhappy. Come, said Poirot kindly. Let us talk of something else. Wasn't that the Scotland Yard man whom I met on the stairs? Yes, Inspector Jap. The light was so dim, I wasn't sure. By the way, he came round and asked me some questions about that poor girl, Carlotta Adams, who died of an overdose of veronal. You knew her well Miss Adams? Not very well. I knew her as a child in America. I came across her here once or twice but I never saw very much of her. I was very sorry to hear of her death. You liked her? Yes. She was extraordinarily easy to talk to. A personality very sympathetic yes, I found the same. I suppose they think it might be suicide. I knew nothing that could help the inspector. Carlotta was always very reserved about herself. I do not think it was suicide, said Poirot. Far more likely to be an accident, I agree. There was a pause. Then Poirot said with a smile. The affair of Lord Edgeware's death becomes intriguing, does it not? Absolutely amazing. Do you know have they any idea who did it now that Jane is definitely out of it? Maze we they have a very strong suspicion. Brian Martin looked excited. Really? Who? The butler has disappeared. You comprehend flight is as good as a confession. The butler. Really, you surprise me. A singularly good-looking man. I L V resemble un Pu. He bowed in a complimentary fashion. Of course. I realized now why the butler's face had struck me as being faintly familiar when I first saw it. You flatter me, said Brian Martin with a laugh. No, no, no. Do not all the young girls, the servant girls, the flappers, the typists, the girls of society, do they not all adore him? Brian Martin? Is there one who can resist you? A lot, I should think, said Martin. He got up abruptly. Well, thank you very much, M. Poirot. Let me apologize again for having troubled you. He shook hands with us both. Suddenly, I noticed he looked much older. The haggard look was more apparent. I was devoured with curiosity, and as soon as the door closed behind him, I burst out with what I wanted to know. Poirot, did you really expect him to come back and relinquish all idea of investigating those queer things that happened to him in America? You heard me say so, Hastings. But then I followed the thing out logically. Then you must know who this mysterious girl is that he had to consult. He smiled. I have a little idea, my friend. As I told you, it started from the mention of the gold tooth, and if my little idea is correct, I know who the girl is, I know why she will not let M. Martin consult me. I know the truth of the whole affair. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.